Let's um, resume. So the next talk will be Martin Zandfux from ETH Zurich telling us about finally a security proof for the DPS protocol. So Martin, please go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you for the, the introduction. Um, so as the title says, I will be talking about our um, recent security proof of the differential phase shift um, QKD protocol. Um, this is joint work together with, with Marcus, um, Vilasini, and, and Ramona. Um, okay, so first I will give a very brief introduction, and I will make it um, really very brief because you already had one. Um, but just to, to recap, we have two parties, Alice and Bob. They, they aim to, to establish a um, shared key, so it should be the same between the two. That's the correctness statement, and it should be uncorrelated to Eve. That's the, the secrecy statement. Um, and for any good QKD protocol, um, we would like to have the following properties. Um, first, the key should look uniformly random to Eve, no matter what she do, does. Um, the protocol should be fairly straightforward to implement using currently available technology. Um, and then lastly, we want that the theoretical description of the protocol should uh, match the, the actual implementation because there have been lots of loopholes um, where if, if there's a mismatch, this can be exploited by a, by a potential adversary. Okay, um, and so here is the basic setup of this differential phase shift protocol. Um, so contrary to the previous talk, this here is a device dependent protocol. So we assume that the boxes here labeled as Alice and Bob, they are trusted. So they really perform what, what is written here. But, but Eve in the middle, she is allowed to do any operation allowed by the laws of quantum mechanics. Um, and so you see in Alice's lab, she has a laser um, and a, a phase modulator. Then, oh, wrong button. Um, and then what she does is she chooses a random bit, u, uniformly at random, feeds it into her phase modulator, and encodes this bit in, a, in the phase of a coherent state. Um, and then this uh, signal gets sent through Eve's channel and at some point arrives on Bob's side. And what Bob does with his interferometer here, this is the mach zinder interferometer, um, he measures the relative phase between two consecutive pulses. So um, to illustrate this, let's, let's look at, it, at an example. Um, so suppose that this bit u here was a one, then Bob gets a negative phase for this round, and if, let's say, from the previous round, he got a um, coherent state with a positive phase, um, he interferes these, these two states with different phases, and let's say one of his detectors clicks, and the other one remains dark. Um, and so depending on the relative phase between these two pulses, either this detector down here will click or, or this one up here. So for instance, if both of them were a minus, this one up here will click, and, and this one would remain dark. Um, and so he is able to reconstruct the relative phases between the different pulses, and they can then use this as a, as a shared key. And as in pretty much any QKD protocol, if there are too many errors um, during the execution, they, they abort because they conclude that Eve was present and tried to um, get information about the, the raw key bit. Um, and so to more formally state what is sort of the goal of a security proof, it's to, to show a statement of this form. Um, so here, KL is Alice's um, key bit. Um, yeah, Alice's key after any sort of privacy amplification, post processing, whatever they want to do. Um, and E here is Eve's side information at the end of the protocol and should be should be close to product. Um, and so, as commonly done with the leftover hashing lemma, we know that this can be well approximated and these two states, given that we have a lower bound on, on the smooth min entropy. So this whole slide here is just to motivate we want the lower bound on smooth min entropy. Um, and if, if we can do that somehow, then, then we have a security proof. And the, the way we do it is using the entropy accumulation theorem, or more precisely, uh, the generalized entropy accumulation theorem, um, which I have sketched here in a slightly simplified version. So the, the setup is as follows. We have are some initial state, um, row in, and a sequence of channels m1 to, to mn. And we produce some outputs. 
x1 to, to xn, and Eve in the middle is allowed to update her, her side information. And then the entropy accumulation theorem um, makes a, the following statement. It says that the um, min entropy at the very end is lower bounded by um, n times the single round entropy um, up to some second order correction terms. Um, and so if we now want to apply this entropy accumulation theorem to get the bound of this form, we need to answer two questions. Um, so the first one is, what are these m1 to mn? Um, and how do we compute this, this single round entropy? If you have those questions answered, we can just plug it into the theorem and, and get our bound. Okay, and so the rest of this talk will be um, dedicated to answering these two questions. Okay, so let's start with the first one. Um, what are the channels? So in full generality, what Eve could do is she collects all of the states sent by Alice um, S1 through Sn. She applies one massive CPTP map to it, produces a sequence of new states, here also called S1 to Sn, that then get collected by Bob. She keeps some information to herself. Um, and, and then Alice and Bob run the, sort of the protocol around that. Um, the issue is that we don't have really the sequence of channels that we need. And so to overcome this, we impose a condition on Eve, which is that she should not signal from the round i plus one to the previous round. So this is illustrated um, up here. For instance, this Sn here should not communicate to, to Sn minus one. Um, and also any of the, of the previous ones, it should be said. Um, but to keep the, the illustration tidy, I only sort of drew, the, drew it to the previous round. Um, but under this condition, what, you, what can be shown is that um, the map can be decomposed into um, a sequence of CPTP maps, where in each round you have sort of one signal that is processed and um, each side information is, is updated. Um, note we can still sort of have um, signaling from previous to, to later on. So it's not an IID situation, um, but just signaling is restricted in, in one direction. Um, and it can be shown that any sort of CPTP map that has this property can, can be decomposed. Okay, um, and so this is one part of the, of the channel. Um, the other is Alice and Bob. And so for this, what we um, can do is sort of just abstractly um, describe Alice's um, state perif permission as some CPTP map that produces some state and, and the raw key bit u. Um, and Bob's measurement is a bit more complicated. We have this um, first beam splitter here, which we, again, is abstractly some CPTP map that takes the signal and produces some memory system that I call here R prime. It's, it's the same one up here. And then this second part, which is whatever comes through here, gets combined with, with the sort of memory from the previous round. Um, and I think it's used to produce Bob's output, which here is the information about which detector clicked. Um, and so if we now plug this in at both sides of the channel, we get the following picture. So we again have Eve's um, sequence of maps. Then we have Alice's state preparation and this somewhat complicated um, setup on Bob's side where some um, memory is retained from the previous round to the, to the next round, and, and a new bit of information is created on, on Bob's side. And this is also sort of one of the tricky parts about the, the differential phase shift protocol, which has made it very difficult to analyze with previous techniques um, because of this complicated structure on, on Bob's side. Um, so a lot of like standard techniques, let's say Definetti or post-selection, they, they can't really handle this, they, they break. Um, but so now to answer the first question about what the channels are is we, we draw boxes around here and you get our sequence of, of channels. Then to apply the eat, we just simply make this following identification. Um, so we call these to register here as, as each side information. Um, and then we have our, our channels. Okay, so this answers the, the first question. There's, however, still one question remaining, which is how do we compute this, this single round entropy? Um, and so for this, let us pick out now a single round um, here. This is the same as, as before with slightly relabeled systems to, to make it a bit more, more tidy. Um, 
And so as usual, what we do is we work in an entanglement based picture. Um, so we assume that instead of, or we say that instead of sending randomly with probability one half the state zero or a plus alpha or minus alpha, um, Eve could have sent the, um, this following entangled state and measured and the system U locally to obtain her, her key bit. And then Bob receives down here some state on, on this, some signal and some, some memory state from before. And the um, main tricky part that remains is that these systems here are in R and S, they're still photonic systems, so they're infinite dimensional, um, which means we cannot really directly compute this, this single round entropy because numerics don't deal well with, with infinite dimensional systems. Um, and so we need a, a technique um, to deal with this and um, the technique is, is known as squashing and here is a sort of broad overview of how it works. So the main idea is to take Bob's measurement here, which again is this, this map B, and um, what we want to do is we want to decompose it into first this squashing operation lambda that takes these systems S and R and produces S tilde and R tilde, which are finite dimensional systems that we, we can deal with. And then afterwards we perform some measurement on, on these lower dimensional systems. And the idea is then to do all of this analysis on the, on the level of the B tilde down here and, um, and not at the infinite dimensional level up there. And for um, technical reasons, we would also like that this lambda map should not signal from, from S to R tilde. So no matter what sort of happens on, on S, it should not um, influence the, this register R tilde. And the reason we want this is because we have this sort of constraint on Eve's original attack. Um, and so we want to preserve this, um, this structure using after, after the squashing. Um, and so, so we'd like this, have this property. And we show that in the paper indeed that a map like this exists, we do so by explicitly constructing it in terms of Krauss operators. Um, it's not very nice expressions, but it, but it works and this is all that, that matters in, in the end is that it exists. Okay, so now we can go back to trying to evaluate single round entropies. And what we do is we plug in what we, we just showed. Um, and then we draw another box, um, this time around this entire bit up here, so including the beam splitter and uh, the squashing operation, um, and call this E tilde, which is now some alternative attack that Eve could perform on this um, qubit, qubit based protocol. And so for any attack, originally we have this new attack that is at least as strong um, on, on the qubit protocol. So we know the qubit protocol is, um, it provides a lower bound on the, on the on the entropy of the original um, protocol. And so then the final thing you have to do is to cal calculate the single round entropy as we have to minimize over all of these possible channels E tilde um, that have this non-signaling property. That is they should not signal from up here to, to this R tilde down here, there. Um, be because we know this um, squashing method that we introduce does not introduce any signaling here. And so we evaluate the phenomenal entropy um, on the output of Alice and Bob's state um, after Eve has applied her, her channel E tilde here. Okay, so this is the two questions answered and now I would like to discuss the, the results of, of this um, analysis. So the first thing is, um, as always, you get key rates. So we have our, our plot here. On the horizontal axis, you have the transmittance, so which is the um, fraction of, of signals that make it through to Bob. Um, and on the vertical axis, we have the key rate, and we see that um, the asymptotic key rate here in the dashed curve um, decays linearly as a function of the, of the transmittance. And as expected for a different number of rounds, it approaches the, the asymptotic key rate. So it will I mean, it's a regular key rate curve. I think you've, most of you have seen plenty of those. Um, another result that is far more interesting is, is the following. Here what we have is 
we have again our transmittance and our error rate, the, the quantum bit error rate. Um, and so due to previous work by um, Marcus Curti and others, um, they have developed an attack on the differential phase protocol. And what they found is that in this red shaded region here, the protocol is completely insecure. So no key can be produced. So for instance, here, if your transmittance is 10 to the minus four, then you can maybe tolerate maybe two or three um, percent of Cuber. And above that, your protocol becomes insecure. Um, and this attack, um, to, to summarize it, it works by, by Eve doing unambiguous state discrimination analysis um, signals. And if she gets a sufficient number of consecutive conclusive outcomes, she resends them. And if um, she doesn't, she just sends vacuum. Um, and note crucially that this attack does not satisfy this condition from, from before that we don't have any signaling from future runs to, to previous runs. And so if we do in our own analysis, we see that this blue shaded region here is secure. And you see there is this um, overlap between the two. And so what this means is that in this region, the um, security proof disagrees with sort of the previous work about the attacks. This is not sort of contradiction because again, this attack does not satisfy one of the conditions that we have imposed in our, in our security proof. But what it does show is that since our um, security proof includes the IID attacks, the collective attacks, um, that for this protocol, differential phase protocol, the um, coherent attacks really are stronger than, than the collective attacks. And this is somewhat surprising because we know that for pretty much all um, non-QKD protocols, the um, collective attacks really are not any weaker than, than the most general attacks. Um, most security proofs sort of try to reduce the coherent attacks to the collective attacks. And here we show that there really is a separation between the two in, in general. It's a very protocol-specific statement that this, this cannot be done. Um, so to my knowledge, this is the first time this has been um, observed for a QKD protocol. OK, um, so to conclude, um, we have shown that using the um, generalized entropy accumulation theorem, it is possible to prove security of this differential phase shift protocol. Um, to do so, we require a non-signaling constraint on, on Eve's attack, um, which then allows us to employ these tools from causality to define both the channels and then also to evaluate this single round for Neumann entropy. This is this non-signaling constraint I've talked about. Um, and then that a constraint of this form really is necessary if one wishes to reduce the analysis to collective attacks. So this is not just some artifact of our proof technique, but it really is an inherent property of the protocol. OK, and with this, I'm done with my talk. Um, I think we have maybe time for some questions. All right, thank you very much for that talk. Uh, we do have plenty of time for questions, so um, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll give you the mic. Okay. Thanks for the talk. So maybe it's a bit of a technical question, but when you show that Eve's channel is separable, yeah. you did that, that's because she cannot single to the previous round, let's say, but she, she does can single to the next round. Yes. So so how do you conclude that it's separable just by, from, from one side? I'm just a bit surprised that it's enough from one side. So um, let, let's look at this here. Um, so I think from the picture down here, um, it is fairly easy to see that this um, sequence of channel does not signal, let's say, from S2 to, to S1, right? There's no line connecting the two. Um, so it's fairly easy to show any channel of this form has this, this property up here. And then you can do the converse as well. You can show any channel that has this property can be decomposed like this. And the proof is somewhat, it's not super technical, but it's not like trivial to see. This is okay. something that needs, that we need to prove. Okay. 
this is like where the sort of tools from, from causality really come in, where people have looked at this, just abstractly at these, these kind of non-signaling relations and what, what this means for the maps, and we can make use of these, these tools here. OK, OK, thanks. All right, thank you. Uh, further questions? Maybe, yeah, let's stick to, to this non signaling stuff for a minute. So I'm slightly worried about the feedback. Um, so can you like move to the plot with a Curti attack? Um, Which one? The one with the Curti attack and... Ah, okay. Yes. Um, so yeah, firstly, this is not on your work, but just out of curiosity. What accounts for these like weird non-convex ah. regions? And why can't I just take convex combinations and make a convex thing? Okay, yes. So there are these corners here. And this is, has to do with how the attack is constructed. So as said before, the attack works by Eve um, collecting signals and doing unambiguous state discrimination on those. And if she gets a sufficient number of them, um, she resends it and otherwise not. And each one of these corners is like for a different number of signals that Eve has to sort of correctly process before she resends it. Um, and then in between, they do this sort of um, convex combination of, of the two, right? So there you say, oh, if it's like, I don't know, maybe if she gets like, I don't know what it would be here, but maybe like 10 in a row um, conclusive outcomes, um, then she, in, in between here, she would like with some probability resend them with some probability just send vacuum, right? So really the core of the attack are these sort of corners and then they interpolate between the, the two. I mean, there's no reason to assume that this attack is optimal in any way. Um, this is where, where we get the corners from. And so towards the end, you pointed out that this kind of shows some necessity of the sequentiality assumption, um, because otherwise you turn into a contradiction. Um, but is there like any security proof without this? I mean, there's still a, a region that's not shaded red, right? Where in principle, it might sure. be secure without a sequentiality assumption. So is this like possible in principle? And do you have a sense of what sort of technical barriers there are to proving this? OK, yes, of course, there's this region here where there's no contradiction. Well, I mean, um, you could also have like the blue but not red region um, proven I mean, secure I'm, without a sequentiality assumption, right? Down here, OK. Um, so there's a lot of different work on this. Um, there's very few pieces of work that look at exactly the same protocol. So. I mean, usually what people tend to do is that they slightly modify the protocol where they look at blocks of, of rounds and then sort of extract like a bit of key in, in each block instead of sort of round, round per round and they sort of ignore the correlations between the blocks, which keeps some of the properties of the original protocol, but, um, but not all of them. Um, and so there, of course, they don't get any contradictions or well, it's not a contradiction, but any sort of conflict with, with the um, attack because they don't have this, this property. But then again, it's not the same protocol that this Curti paper attacks anyway. So the comparison is sort of a bit muddy, I would say. There's any hope of having security proofs? I mean, the sequentiality assumption comes in twice here, right? It comes in sort of, or well, like it's used twice in a sense. It comes in once sort of just from the structure of the DPS protocol, um, like the sort of relativistic constraints, but then also it comes in as a technical condition and generalized EAT. Um, so suppose you like, you know, got rid of the generalized EAT and replaced it by some other magic technique. Could you like hope to prove security without any sequentiality assumption for any region? I mean, I would like to have this magic technique, um, but I don't know how you would derive it, right? Um, generally, what you want is to have some, in the end, some problem that is small enough that you can tackle it, either numerically or analytically. And if you don't sort of reduce stuff to a single round, if you need to like, like now look at all rounds at the same time, it looks very untractable to me. Doesn't mean it's impossible. Um, okay, so we'll note the magic technique as open questions. <laughs> um, so, are there more questions from the audience? We still have plenty of time. So there are a bunch of like other photonic protocols, like Kyle and so on. What are like the key sort of difficulties in extending this to those other protocols? Like, could you just do the same, or 
what, what's sort of preventing you from doing all of these in, in one go? Yeah, um, the main te technical problem is, is this step here. Um, so if we want to do any sort of single round calculation, we need to have this reduction from the fin infinite dimensional space to the finite dimensional one. And whether or not this is possible or how easy it is to do depends on the specific measurements in the protocol. Um, and so for this measurement here that we look at for the DPS protocol, we can find it and, and it exists. But for the, for the cow protocol, it, it seems like it's not necessarily possible. Even for the DPS, if we assume that the beam split here is no longer 50-50, we run into troubles. So for, for this our part of the argument to go through, it really relies on specific structure of the, of the measurements. Um, there are techniques other than this where you don't do this sort of squashing operation to have similar reduction in, in dimension. Um, I couldn't get any one of those to work for, for DPS or, or cow yet, but this would certainly be an open direction for, for future work. So does, like, what, what part fails? Is it the squashing in general, or is it like the non-signaling squashing specifically? Um, depending on what you try to do, either or both. Um, well, OK. It's not great. So, Certainly, this non-signaling one fails quite quickly. So this, um, if we assume this no longer to be 50-50, I think the squashing still works, but not necessarily with the, with the non-signaling one. Um, but then for more complicated setups, as you have in the Korean one-way protocol, where there's like several arms in box uh, measurement, and it's really a, lot, a big mess, then um, there, to my knowledge, are no known sort of exact techniques there. You have to rely on some approximate techniques. Um, there are several that people have, have tried and that work, but those you, I don't know how to make them work with this sort of non-signaling condition. Right, um, last call for questions from the audience. Um, otherwise, let's thank Martin again.